Okay. So it's two after 10, so why don't we get started? Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Russ Wenninger. I'm a lawyer with the Wenninger Jong Law Firm. And I've been doing a, a weekly webinar series over the last little more than a month on COVID-19 and immigration. So I'm trying to talk about things that might be of interest to people who uh, they don't yet have permanent residence and they're currently in Canada and uh, they want to preserve their temporary status. Maybe they want to acquire permanent resident status. Uh, so I've been doing this every Wednesday for the last month and a bit, uh, about 10 o'clock on Wednesday mornings. And so today I'm going to, uh, it's not really structured, I'm just going to give a bit of a, a, some, some updates about what, what's been happening over the last little while. Some, some... <laughs> I don't know, rumors, I guess you could say, some speculation about what, what might happen down the road in terms of uh, immigration law and policy. So, that, so that's going to be the focus today. And I'm also going to take viewer questions. So if anyone at any point uh, has any questions at all, please put it, those questions in the live chat box and uh, I will answer as many of those questions as I possibly can. Uh, my, my one uh, caveat though would be to make sure that you don't uh, reveal too much personal information about yourself. Th this is YouTube, this is you know public, this is for the whole world to see, not that the whole world will see my little YouTube channel, but you know. <laughs> In, in theory, that's possible that, uh, the, you know, people from all over the world could be. And in fact, I, I do get um, inquiries from all over the world from people who have watched my YouTube channel. So, so I would strongly encourage you not to uh, list too much identifying information about yourself if, if you're going to ask any type of question because... Uh, yeah, you know, you never know who's going to be watching this live stream. I should also mention I'll be uh, post um, posting an archive version of this live stream on my YouTube channel as well. So if if you have to duck out, if you miss part of it, if you show up late, uh, there will still be the opportunity to go back later on and 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 watch the the webinar if if you uh, miss something or if uh, you forgot what I said and you want to go over it again, it will be on YouTube. But for that reason, because it, it is going to be, you know, for the the long haul, going to be up on YouTube. Uh, yeah, don't don't put anything too too personal uh, if you if you have any questions. Okay, well, um, yeah, we've got four people tuned in so far. I'm not sure if that's counting me or not, but uh, but that's good. That's uh, showing that that some people are getting some benefit from this. I, I oftentimes find actually when I do these YouTube live stream webinars is that other people will tune in uh, later to watch. So I'll get a certain number of views uh from the initial live stream and then within about 24 hours to 48 hours uh, those views will be doubled or tripled so so that means people are actually tuning in but but they're maybe not tuning in uh, right during the live stream but the advantage of of watching the live stream is that you get to ask questions so if you have any questions uh, and those questions don't have to be about your situation. They could be about a friend's situation. It could be a more theoretical question. Uh, ideally, I'd like to keep it to immigration law related topics. So if you have any 
uh, questions about Canadian immigration law. I'm, I'm happy to address those, but I don't want to be taking questions about landlord tenant law or about criminal law or about things that I, I don't really deal with on a, on a day to day basis. Uh, my, my, my focus in my practice, I, I practice in a couple of areas, actually. Um, I practice in, in wills and estates, but I also practice in the area of, or my primary practice area, I should say, is Canadian immigration law. So, um, so uh, well, I shouldn't say my primary practice. It's, it's, it's close to 50-50 wills and estates and, and, uh, and immigration. But, um, and I also do the odd litigation file um uh, you know so, sometimes i'll delve into other areas of law but uh, uh but for the most part i, f I focus on immigration and and uh, wills and estates and in terms of immigration i focus on canadian immigration so um uh, some, sometimes people call me up they ask me if i do American immigration work, or if I can help them apply for a visa to Thailand, or if I can, you know, help them apply for a visa to Australia or something like that. Um, no, I, I'm not licensed to practice law in any of those jurisdictions. I'm only pr licensed to practice law in Canada. Um, I should also note, I, I don't really give any advice on um, uh, immigration to Quebec. Uh, Quebec requires, uh, Quebec immigration kind of re requires specialized knowledge that, that should be offered by a, a lawyer from Quebec. So, so I don't advise clients on, on any Quebec immigration applications. Um, my, my advice to a, to a client, uh, wanting to immigrate to Quebec would be to, have a chat with a Quebec immigration lawyer. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, in most areas of, of Canadian immigration law, I practice um, some areas more than others, but, uh, but I'm a bit of a jack of all trades when it comes to Canadian immigration law. I do everything from refugee claims to spousal sponsorships. Uh, I do some work permit applications. I do some study permit applications. I do express entry. Uh, I've done the odd judicial review application. Uh, so yeah, I, I practice in you know in a number of different areas related to Canadian immigration law. Uh, I should tell you a little bit about kind of my, my personal background as well. So um, I, I think it was maybe last week or the week before I mentioned I, I grew up in, in Pincher Creek, Alberta. And, uh, and I did um, my, my first bit of university education at the University of, of Lethbridge. Well, actually, I shouldn't say that. I, I, I spent a year up in Edmonton at the University of Alberta when I was 18 years old. So just out of high school, I spent a year up in, in Edmonton and uh, I got a little bit homesick actually. And so I wanted to be closer to my family in Pincher Creek. And so I transferred to the University of my Lethbridge and uh, to, to the University of Lethbridge. And I, I completed my degree at the University of Lethbridge in, it was a, a Bachelor of Arts degree and it was a double major in music and philosophy. And oftentimes people like me who do degrees in things like music or philosophy, or in my case, music and philosophy, um, <laughs> they have trouble finding work afterwards. And, and uh, because those, those degree programs uh, tend to be for, for students who, who are doing it out of a kind of a personal interest, but, but they're not necessarily uh, degree programs that are uh, uh, geared towards vocations. I should actually, yeah, philosophy isn't that way um, for sure. Uh, but uh, but music, um, uh, there there is a, a vocational aspect to that for sure. Mo most people doing music degrees want to be performing musicians or or teach music, uh, but. The unfortunate fact of the matter is that uh, it's it's tough to make a, a living as a musician, uh, and so 
uh, when I was in law school, oftentimes <laughs> other people in my classes were, were people who had completed various arts degrees or fine arts degrees. Uh, they, they were passionate about something like music. I, I had one friend who, who in law school who did a degree in medieval music. Um, maybe even, I think she did a master's in medieval music. Um, but she, uh, yeah, ultimately, uh, went, went to law school. Um, so yeah, among the lawyers out there in Canada, many of them have these interesting and varied backgrounds. Some, some lawyers even come from scientific or engineering fields, um, I had some friends in law school who were chemists, engineers, uh, people like that, and and then they decided they they wanted to to give law a try. So, uh, so yeah, I, I did my undergrad degree at the University of Lethbridge um, in with a combined major in music and philosophy, and I absolutely loved Lethbridge. And then I went to Dalhousie University to do a master's degree in philosophy. And I ended up um, after that wanting to stay in Halifax. And I wasn't really sure what I was going to do though. Uh, but I wanted to still wanted to be a university student, still wanted to stay in Halifax. So I, so I did some computer science courses and and then I eventually applied to law school and I got accepted to Dalhousie Law School. So I, I completed my degree there and and then ended up uh, moving back to Alberta. I wanted to be closer to my family. So I moved back. Um, this was in the mid 2000s and uh, and then got a job at a, a law firm up in Edmonton to to article and and then I, after articling, moved down to Calgary and I started my own practice. And, and then just last year, so in, in the fall of 2019, I joined up with a, a, another lawyer, Kathy Jong, um, and we formed the Weninger Jong Law Firm. And I should tell you a little bit about Kathy because Kathy has a very interesting background. Kathy's a, a real immigrant success story. Uh, so Kathy, uh, she was a, um, a, a lawyer in China, actually. And, and in fact, uh, she wasn't just a lawyer. She was actually a judge in China. She graduated top of her class from one of the top law schools in China. Uh, after law school, she worked as a judge. And, and then she, she ended up doing a, um, a master's degree at uh, the University of Hong Kong, which is a very prestigious, uh, it's, it's one of the top universities in the world, basically. So she did a master's degree in common law. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, there's a bit of a distinction between uh, legal systems. Um, uh, many legal systems around the world, including the legal system in China, they use uh, a, a legal system based on based historically on Roman law. So it's it's called a civil law system. Uh, so that's that's probably the most common legal legal system in the world. But the other common legal system is the the common law legal system. Uh, so the um, the system that derives from English law historically. And so in Canada, in the US, in the UK, um, in India, um, in uh, basically any country, Australia, New Zealand, any any country that used to be a um, uh, part of the the British Empire, uh, th those those countries use common law or tend to use common law legal systems. Uh, and, and that's the way it is in Canada. Actually, Canada is a mixed system because we, in Quebec, uh, Quebec actually uses a civil law system for, for most of its law. Um, so Quebec's a little bit of an anomaly, but the rest of Canada uses a common law system of law. So, so back to Kathy. So she, she did this, uh, degree in common law, uh, a master's degree in common law from, uh, the university of Hong Kong, because Hong Kong also, it was 
formerly part of the British Empire, and so uh, they they have a common law legal system as well. So uh, China's kind of, if you could call China slash Hong Kong, um, you know, a, a country, and I, I guess they are. Um, uh, you know, they, cer certainly a nation or a country in in, in many respects, uh, 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 but it's it's kind of the inverse of Canada. So, uh, so in Canada, uh, we have the, most of most of the provinces being common law jurisdictions, and Quebec is the anomaly. It's a civil law jurisdiction. In China, it's the reverse. So, in China, most of the country is civil law but in hong kong it's a common law jurisdiction so uh so it was kathy studied there uh, in hong kong and got her master's degree in common law um and then she she eventually uh, immigrated to canada and went to dalhousie university and did a master's at dalhousie university which was where i i did law school as well i didn't know her at the time we we went at different times and and you know study different things with different people basically but but yeah we both went to dalhousie law school uh so so yeah then kathy once she graduated from dalhousie law school she moved out to alberta and to calgary and articled and upon completion of her articles she started her own law firm and was was almost super successful overnight uh, in in Calgary, uh, despite the fact that we've got a number of uh, people from China living living in Calgary, and China's one of the top source countries for for immigrants to Canada. Uh, so so despite the fact that we've got a lot of immigrants from China and Calgary, there there are very few Mandarin speaking lawyers here in Calgary and, and Kathy is one of them. So, um, so, uh, Kathy really made a name for herself, especially in the Chinese community as, um, a, a top quality lawyer. Um, so yeah, if, if you ever get a chance to, uh, if you have some legal issue that, that requires a, a good quality lawyer, um, I'd highly recommend uh, my, my colleague Kathy Zhang. Uh, uh, she practices primarily in the areas of, of business law, so corporate commercial law. Uh, she also does residential real estate. She also does litigation and family law. And she does a little bit of immigration law as well. I, I focus mostly on immigration and, and Kathy focuses on a lot of the other things. But uh, uh, there's a good chance you m might need a lot of the, the other things. You, you know, the average person will at, at some point in their life purchase a, a house or sell a house. Uh, a lot of people will start businesses, especially immigrants. Oftentimes immigrants start businesses. And, and for that, you oftentimes need a good lawyer. So. So, uh, so Kathy does that work. So, yeah, as, as I was mentioning, I, I uh, joined up with, with Kathy back in, in 2019 and we, we formed the Weninger Dong offer. And yeah, things have been going great aside from the pandemic and, <laughs> uh, you know, but, but a couple months ago, I, uh, I don't know personally i was kind of worried that that we were into a, a virtual apocalypse but but you know a couple of months in uh you know yeah i think things could be better but uh on the whole uh i think uh the government in canada is is doing a good job of of managing the pandemic and uh, life is slowly getting back to normal. Um, the economy hasn't completely cratered, and I'm cautiously optimistic. So I, I think, you know, hope, hopefully, uh, it, it's going to be a new normal for sure. We're, we're going to have to continue to take precautions, but it, it seems like life is improving, and and at the very least, life isn't as bad as as it could be during a pandemic um 
Now, that relates actually to uh, so, some advice I've given in, in earlier webinars. So in, in some earlier webinars, I wasn't really um, necessarily sure how bad the pandemic would get. And, um, you know, so I considered some best case scenarios and I considered some some worst case scenarios. And, um, and, and the worst case scenarios were that you know, people would be trapped in Canada, that a lot of businesses would be shut down, that that people wouldn't be able to get back home, and maybe the situation in, in people's home countries would, would be dire. You'd have people um, dying in large numbers and bodies piling up on in the streets and things like that. And um, so, uh, so a, a couple of things I recommended that people consider um, uh, one is a humanitarian and compassionate grounds application. So uh, if, if a person wants to qualify for permanent residence and they don't otherwise qualify for permanent residence, um, and they're, they're currently in Canada, one, one, thing they, one thing they can potentially do is apply uh, for permanent residence based on humanitarian and compassionate considerations. And to do that, uh, what you have to do is, is satisfy an immigration officer that there are compelling humanitarian reasons for for you in particular to be allowed to stay in Canada permanently, uh, even though you don't otherwise meet the requirements for permanent residence. Uh, so, so this this was one stream I, I kind of recommended uh, that people consider uh, humanitarian and compassionate grounds. Now, uh, given kind of the trajectory of the pandemic, given, you know, the fact that um, in, in, not necessarily in all parts of the, of the world, but in some parts of the world, the pandemic maybe hasn't hit that hard. Um, things maybe aren't as, as bad as they could have been. Um, and, and in Canada, we, we seem to be getting you know, uh, control of things. We seem to be flattening the curve on the, the pandemic. Um, hospital rate, hospitalization rates tend to be going down in most parts of the country. Uh, the death rate seems to be going down. So uh, things, things could have been more dire and they, they turned out to be maybe not as bad, at least in Canada and at least in, in some other parts of the world. Um, and, and so um, the, the the fact that I, I recommended humanitarian applications to people, um, and I think humanitarian applications might still be um, viable options for some people who are, who are stuck in Canada right now and who want to apply for permanent residence, um, but it, it might not be a universally applicable solution. Uh, there, it may be the case that, you know, in a couple of months, airlines start, you know, doing more routine international flights. Uh, it might be the case that the government opens up the borders again and people are allowed to travel back home. Um, and, uh, it, you know, it, it might be the case that, uh, who knows, maybe we even get a vaccine or something like that or some, some effective treatment for COVID-19. Uh, and if that's the case, a lot of the arguments in, in support of a humanitarian application will, will go out the window. And practically speaking, it takes, in many cases, in most cases, probably somewhere between a year and two years to process a humanitarian application. So, so an agency, a humanitarian and compassionate grounds application, uh, it, it usually takes uh, about a year or so to process uh, the first stage of the application. Uh, and then if a person gets an approval in principle, um, it, it might take, you know, six months to a year after that to get permanent residence. I, I'm not sure of the, the, the average processing times recently for humanitarian applications, but I, I think it's probably somewhere in that one year to two year range, um, 
So, uh, and, and going forward, I think as a, as a rule, um, due to the fact that Right now, a lot of immigration officers are working from home, and and some backlogs are are building up, and and things like that. Uh, processing for most immigration applications will probably take longer than 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 they have in the past, and so a humanitarian application, I think you can expect it to take at least two years uh, to to be processed to completion. Uh, that that may not end up being the case, but but I, I suspect that's going to be the case. So uh, so in other words, if you submit an application now, and six months from now there's a vaccine and everyone's back to work and people are traveling all over the world and and um, you know this this pandemic. Aside from the fact that there's maybe a lot of government debt and maybe some businesses went under and things like that, but but you know in six months maybe maybe this pandemic is largely just a you know a, a bad memory. Um, so if that's the case, then a humanitarian application under those circumstances uh, might not succeed. Even if at the time you 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 submitted your application, you had a bunch of very strong humanitarian grounds for for applying for permanent residence. If in six months' time, or a year's time, or a year and a half's time, or or, or something like that, when the, when they're uh, you know processing your application, they they come to the the immigration officer comes to the realization that a lot of the the initial humanitarian concerns no longer apply um, then that that sort of application there, there's a good chance it'll be rejected so uh, so I, I just wanted people to to be aware of that that uh, I'm not necessarily backtracking on on my earlier suggestion that people look at humanitarian applications because I, I think they're still worth looking at um, but um, one thing is oftentimes people contact my office and uh, I had this happen the other day actually and it kind of kind of ticked me off a little bit um, uh, someone someone contacted me and there there were you know we were exchanging a lot of emails back and forth and 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 they were they're trying to you know fish for a lot of you know free legal advice from me basically and so so you know they kept on prodding me, you know, well, well, how do you do this? And, and, and what's the process for this? And, and, you know, finally, I just said, you know, look, you know, I'm not doing this for free. You're going to have to, you know, I, I do provide free content on, on YouTube and, and in other places on, on the internet. But, uh, but if, if you want me to spend time dealing with your personal circumstances, you're going to have to pay for that in a consultation. And, and then the person responded saying, well, but I, but I first of all need to make sure that, that you're going to be able to, uh, to get me the result I want. I, I need you to provide me with, with a guarantee. And, and I told them point blank, I, uh, this person, I said, there are no guarantees. I, I can't guarantee uh, that, that anything we do will, will necessarily succeed. Um, by the way, if, if anyone tells you, so, so if any, any immigration lawyer gives you an absolute guarantee or where, where you see this a lot is in immigration consultants. So, so immigration consultants, um, I've seen, uh, my, my colleague, Kathy Jong, actually, she, she's shown me, um, advertisements that some immigration consultants circulate in China in, and, and so these these advertisements are, are written in Mandarin Chinese um, and and they basically promise people permanent residence they say if you pay us X number of dollars and X number of dollars is usually something outrageous like you know fifty thousand dollars or sixty thousand dollars or some some absurd obscene sum of money and and now now i should mention that in some cases for some immigration streams that that might be um uh you know an appropriate um 
immigration fee for uh, for um, you know applying under or some particular stream, but uh, but for the things these people were applying for, it was it was way out of line. So you know, a simple work permit, and the person would be spending you know fifty thousand bucks, sixty thousand bucks, something like that. So that's that's basically fraudulent. That that's a uh, um, you know, yes, in, in theory, uh, you know, uh, an immigration lawyer or consultant can charge what, it, but there is a market rate for, for certain immigration services. And if you're paying more than, say, a few thousand bucks for a routine work permit application, uh, so something's probably wrong. Um, so, so anyways, uh, yeah, Kathy and I would would sometimes, or Kathy would would note sometimes she get friends and and acquaintances from China sending her these these messages about these advertisements in China, uh, promising permanent residence if you if you paid a certain amount of money and um, it, and to make it absolutely crystal clear. Uh, no, no one can guarantee you permanent residence. Absolutely no one. Uh, even if you're an immigration officer, you can't you can't guarantee that someone will get permanent residence because there are there are so many um, steps along the way to acquiring permanent residence, and so many variables and uh, and there are a lot of different decision makers. Uh, so when you submit a permanent residence application, for example, you submit an application that gets reviewed by a particular immigration officer. And, and, and maybe it's being reviewed by more than one immigration officer. It might be initially reviewed for completeness and then passed on to someone else to do a, a more, ref, uh, more thorough uh, review of the application. But uh, the the immigration application uh, eventually, even when when a person is, you know, given the the you know sort of conditional approval for permanent residence, they they still have to uh, go and, and do what's called a landing interview. So they still have to uh, they have one final step where where they have to. Um, uh, meet with with an immigration officer who's probably going to be a different immigration officer than, than the person who reviewed the application or, or they have to go and, and uh, meet with a Canada Border Services officer that that's another way to do the landing interview so so at that stage the application can get rejected even even if um, you know the initially the immigration officer seen that that was processing the application seemed to approve everything. So, um, so yeah, my, my point being is that there are no guarantees. Uh, there can't be any guarantees and anyone who tells you that they're guaranteeing you success in an immigration application, they're probably a con artist. They're probably a scam artist, um, a charlatan. Uh, they, uh, they either don't know what they're talking about. So they're either very inexperienced or they're, they're trying to pull the wool over your eyes. They're trying to deceive you. They're trying to take your money. And, and unfortunately there's very little recourse. Um, if, if a lawyer rips you off, you can potentially complain to the you can complain to the law society. You can you can sue the lawyer. You can, there there are certain things you can do. Um, with if an immigration uh, consultant rips you off, uh, if they're a licensed immigration consultant, you can report them to the uh, what's called ICCRC, which is the regulatory body for for immigration consultants here in Canada. Uh, unfortunately, ICCRC is is very lax in its enforcement of of standards. So so oftentimes they, um, you know, basically don't don't you know do a lot of investigation when when people file complaints. 
so, um, you know, it's practically the case that that immigration consultants in, in many respects can get away with murder. Um, they they oftentimes steal their clients' money. Uh, they oftentimes get very bad results for clients that that could have been good results had had the, the consultants been doing their job properly. And and there's very re little recourse for the client afterwards. Um, so uh, now I'm not saying that all immigration licensed immigration consultants are bad or anything like that, but there are a significant number. There is a significant number of immigration consultants uh, uh, that that that's you know not up to par and, and maybe even ripping people off. Um, then there are ghost consultants. So those are people who aren't even licensed uh, as as licensed immigration consultants, and and these these are people who are probably not even operating in Canada. They're probably just operating overseas in places like China. Although in some cases they might be operating in Canada, and if if those people um, uh, rip you off. If you're in Canada, yeah, may, maybe you can complain to the RB, RCMP or to uh, Canada Border Services or something, and maybe they'll investigate. Uh, but um, uh, but but if it's overseas, if it's in a place like China that these these people are operating, or in you know India or Pakistan or uh, the Philippines or, you know, off th those are oftentimes places where ghost consultants will operate unlicensed immigration consultants. Uh, so if, if these people are operating in those sorts of places, um, there's very little, um, uh, enforcement that the Canadian government can, can bring to bear in th those circumstances. So, uh, so it's, it's kind of buyer beware to a certain degree if, if you're dealing with, with one of those uh, overseas ghost consultants. And uh, I would strongly recommend not doing that. It's, it's basically, if you're using one of those consultants, as far as, as, far as IRCC is concerned, um, if they're not licensed, um, you're actually violating um, Canadian immigration law. So, uh, that that in and of itself is is a reason for IRCC to reject your application if they find out that you uh, were receiving help from an unlicensed immigration consultant. Um, but that being said, e even if the immigration consultant is licensed, um, uh, you should be very skeptical um, about the advice that you get, and you should, you know, be very reluctant to give large sums of money to to such consultants. Um, uh, you know, two to three thousand bucks for a work permit application, three to five thousand dollars for a permanent residence application. Uh, those sorts of fees are are probably reasonable, but but if if you're uh, talking, you know, fifty thousand bucks, sixty thousand bucks for you know, a work permit application or something like that. That that's not reasonable. Um. So, so, yeah. Um. And that that goes back to to my my earlier comment about guarantees. Uh, there, in immigration law. There, there can't be any outcome guarantees, uh, or at least no, no professional, no, no, um, uh, no one in my position, for example, would be able to offer such a guarantee. And and if um, a lawyer or a consultant or anyone told you they were guaranteeing. Um, that something would be approved that 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 right there should be a red flag um another reason i don't guarantee um outcomes is because uh success 
in in these sorts of applications depends so much on the accuracy of the information that the client is providing to me and i have no way of knowing uh whether the client is telling me the truth um so there there are some situations where clients may lie about their past to me or give me false documents or things like that and so if if that gets revealed that the client is going to be banned uh, from Canada for misrepresentation for five years, so how how can I possibly guarantee that? I I simply can't. So, um, yeah. Uh, if anyone tells you that uh, you can get permanent residence guaranteed just by hiring them, uh, they're they're full of garbage and don't don't believe a word they say. Um, so, so yeah, I, I wanted to, you know, let, let people know that I think that maybe, you know, the, the human humanitarian application, application, um, option that, that I was promoting a little bit earlier. Um, I'm still promoting it. I, I, th I think it's still a good idea for people to consider in many cases, but, um, uh, you know, the, the way the pandemic is playing out and the way things are, are slowly starting to get back back to normal and um, considering the timelines for humanitarian applications, um, I, I, I suspect it, it's, it's still the case that um, most of those applications probably won't succeed. Some, some, some will, um, um, you know, I'm not sure what recent stats for success rates on humanitarian applications are, but but I, I remember at, at least a few years back, I, I was looking at some stats where where humanitarian success rates were in in the the neighborhood of you know 25 percent or something like that. So um, you know, it's it's possible that you'll succeed with your humanitarian application, but it's also quite possible that you won't succeed is my point uh, the same with temporary resident permits permit applications um, uh, I've I've been advocating um, their use as well as a possible remedy if, if you fall out of status or if you want to apply for permission to to work in Canada and you don't have other viable means of applying for a work permit than a temporary resident permit application is is a possibility but um uh, one of the big problems with with temporary resident permits like with humanitarian applications they take a long time to be processed so a temporary resident permit application might might take more than a year to to be processed and in the meantime if if things have improved in canada and in other parts of the world if uh, covid19 numbers have gone down if debt rates have gone down maybe we have a vaccine even um, so uh, getting getting approvals for for temporary resident permits trps might might be tricky um, for for a lot of people um, but but it's still something to consider if you have no other viable means for for applying for for example worker status or for preserving your status as a visitor in uh, in Canada, um, so so a TRP might might be the uh, you know a possible remedy. It, it might be the way to go, but um, don't don't get your hopes up. Don't put all your eggs in that basket uh, because um, yeah, it it may or it may not work. Uh, another similar strategy, it's actually not really similar, but it's, it's, a, it's a strategy that I, I recommended, um, is uh, to, to look at doing significant benefit work permit applications. So uh, I, I strongly, uh, I, I felt, well, I had this, um, this view and, and I, I still hold that view actually that um, that anyone working in the economy right now is significantly benefiting the economy anyone who's working uh, 
paying taxes, paying rent, uh, buying their own groceries. Uh, anyone who's doing that is significantly benefiting the economy. Uh, that's my view, and I, and I think that's objectively correct. Um, uh, you know, in in a situation where you have massive unemployment numbers, where you have uh, you know large numbers of people unable to pay rent or buy groceries or things like that, um, in a situation like that, being able to do those basic things uh, means that you're providing a net benefit to the the Canadian economy. And uh, there there is a work permit stream for that, and it's called significant benefit work permit. Um, and so a significant benefit work permit is just, it's not restricted to economic benefit, but it, but it can be used for that purpose when, when a person's work in Canada would, would lead to a, a significant economic benefit. Um, now, uh, part of the problem with, with significant benefit work permit applications is that they're usually reserved for people who are starting businesses in Canada or for artists or athletes or, you know, scientists of international renown or, or pe people like that. So, um, you know, a hotel worker in Banff would, would such a person qualify for a significant benefit work permit? Ordinarily not. Ordinarily that, that person would, would not be a good candidate for a significant benefit work permit. Are they a good candidate now? Um, uh, well, I would say it's still something that, that can be tried and depending on the immigration officer, su such a strategy might succeed. Um, but, um, I, I suspect most immigration officers, uh, given, you know, kind of the, the way things are playing out with with the pandemic with with things starting to get a little bit back to normal again with businesses starting to open up again a little bit uh, with you know the the economy kind of being sustained by government benefits such as the cerb and and the wage subsidy and stuff like that um and the rent subsidy and uh, the commercial rent subsidy and, and the th things like that. So I think um, uh, on the whole, uh, uh, it's going to be a tough sell to uh, to satisfy an immigration officer that uh, someone who's, for example, in a retail job or something like that, that they should qualify for a significant benefit work permit. Um, now that being said, if it's a retail job in something like fast food or in in um, in uh, you know a supermarket, a gro you know a grocery store, um, uh, th th those sorts of workers are considered essential workers, and and you know who who knows maybe an immigration officer would consider uh, that to be you know, justifiable, um, in terms of, you know, uh, being worthy of a, a significant benefit work permit, but it's, it's really hard to say. So, so it's something to maybe try, but, but don't get your hopes up. Uh, don't, um, think that it's, it's a guarantee of, of success or anything like that. It's not uh, significant benefit work permit applications, temporary resident permit applications, humanitarian and compassionate grounds applications. Uh, those things might be worth trying, but but by mo no means are they. Uh, uh, at the best of times, the the likelihood of success for those applications is is kind of small and. And, and I suspect even now the likelihood of success for those sorts of applications is kind of small. So um, in cer certain circumstances, they may be worth trying. And in fact, I'm recommending those applications to, uh, to some 
clients based on their particular circumstances, but um, uh, those applications may or may not be right for you is, is the point I'm trying to make. And you have to do a cost benefit analysis. And, and because every time you submit an application, it's, it's, you know, even if you're doing it yourself and you're not paying legal fees, uh, you're, you're paying government fees and, and there are other costs associated with the application. So, so you yourself have to do a cost benefit analysis and, and, you know, if an application maybe stands a 5% 5 chance of succeeding, uh, in some circumstances that that might be high enough to justify doing the application, but, but you know, maybe for you, uh, the money you would spend on that application would be better spent on a plane ticket home or on something else, buying groceries or something. Um, so, uh, so, so I wanted to mention that uh, uh, that those those sorts of applications that I've been promoting in, in prior webinars they're highly discretionary, and so um, if you're going to do them, I think you should do them as as best you can and make the strongest arguments you can. Uh, but at the end of the day, don't get your hopes up. Uh, the, those applications might not succeed. Uh, so that's a bit of a downer. So that 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 update or that that bit of food for thought. That's probably not what it, what everyone wants to hear. Um, there's some good news as well. Um, it, now, in the past, in one of my webinars, I, I was asked by some people whether uh, there were any concessions being made for uh, for people on study permits, whether. Uh, the government was going to allow people to study remotely or s study um, online and and still qualify for th for things like a postgraduate work permit. Um, and and in the past, I wasn't sure about that, and my gut reaction was no, probably not. Uh, the The government doesn't usually allow online studies to count towards a a degree for, uh, for the purposes of uh, getting a, a postgraduate work permit, um, but um, but recently um, uh, I was checking out the government website and um, noticed uh, a few things. So um, so. Uh, yeah, one thing the government mentioned was that students who are already studying in Canada and whose classes have been moved online due to travel or health restrictions introduced because of COVID-19, they won't be penalized uh, regarding postgraduate work permit eligibility. Uh, so if you're currently in Canada and you're forced to do online classes uh, that that previously would have been in-person classes uh, because of COVID-19, you'll, you'll still be able to qualify for, or you should still be able to qualify for a postgraduate work permit, assuming you, you would have been otherwise eligible to qualify for a postgraduate work permit. Not all students in Canada are eligible for a postgraduate work permit. Um, so it's only certain types of um, educational programs, it's only uh, cer certain types of people. For example, you can only have one postgraduate work permit in your life. So uh, if you, uh, yeah, e even if you're studying in Canada, you might not meet the, the requirements for a postgraduate work permit. Um, but um, but if you otherwise would have met the requirements for a postgraduate work permit, but your your only um, your only obstacle now is that you have to do online courses, uh, that that's okay. You can do those online courses, and it can still count towards your postgraduate work permit. Uh, the the same applies to distance learning outside of Canada. So let's say you were you were scheduled to. Uh, you know, begin a degree program at the University of Saskatchewan, but you can't travel to Canada because 
because of COVID-19. Um, you, you can actually take online courses through the University of Saskatchewan if, if assuming um, those online courses are offered in your program. Uh, but you can take those courses and that can still count uh, towards uh, towards the program of study in Canada. So you can still, I think you can count up to 50% of the, 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 the total courses uh, towards, or, or sorry, uh, you, you can complete up to 50% of your program of study with, with these courses, uh, these um, uh, distance learning courses, um, at least for the time being. So, so that's, that's the policy at the moment. If things change, if the borders open up, and if uh, students are allowed back into Canada, and, and if uh, universities and colleges are starting to resume with with uh, their in-person classes, uh, then this policy will likely end. Um, but but for the time being, you can take online courses uh, and, and have it count towards a degree program or a diploma per program um, uh, for, for the purposes of a uh, having it be considered a Canadian uh, degree or diploma program and for the purposes of, of applying for a postgraduate work permit. Uh, so, so that's some good news. Um, uh, so, so now for some, some more, some bad news um, or some possible bad news. Uh, Jason Kenney, the Premier of Alberta, recently announced that uh, the government would be taking steps to prioritize uh, Canadian permanent resident workers in, in the province of Alberta. Um, so what this, this suggests a couple of things, a couple of possible things. Uh, one thing it suggests is that um, uh, the Alberta Immigrant Nominee Program might see some significant changes in the near future. Uh, there, there might actually be a, a hold put on the program. Um, it might be the case that um, the government um, uh, returns applications that have already been submitted under the program even. Uh, th now, I should be clear, this hasn't been announced, at least as far as I'm aware, this uh, this hasn't been announced. This is pure speculation on my part, but um, but it's entirely possible that, you know, with, with Jason Kenney's announcement that, that the government wants to prioritize uh, Canadians and permanent residents living in Alberta, uh, it's entirely possible that uh, the Alberta Immigrant Nominee Program will uh, see some major changes. Um, and it might be the case that, that applications are paused, put on halt. Um, and maybe applications will even be returned. Maybe, maybe the government will just simply say, uh, we're not going to... Um, do any processing at the moment for, under the Alberta Immigrant Nominee Program, and we we won't uh, do do any processing for the foreseeable future. Um, that's possible. They're not saying that at the moment, as far as I'm aware, but but that that could be uh, what what comes out of Jason Kenney's um, uh, prioritizing permanent residents and Canadian citizens. Another thing the Alberta government could theoretically do um, is something that the Alberta government did a, a couple of years, a few years back during the uh, the economic recession uh, with the oil and gas industry. So, so a few years back, what the government did was they actually had an agreement with with Service Canada. Uh, uh, federally, that LMIAs, labor market impact assessments, wouldn't be issued for ocu certain occupations in Alberta where 
uh, there was significant unemployment in that sector. So, for example, certain trade occupations, certain technical occupations, engineering occupations, things like that, um, uh, things related to oil and gas, the oil and gas industry. Um, the, the, the government actually, the Alberta government, um, um, entered into an agreement with with Service Canada in which Service Canada wouldn't issue LMIAs for those occupations in Alberta. Now, um, so, something like that could could happen going forward uh, potentially. So the the government might even, um, you know, try to do what what uh new brunswick was doing for a while which was to to ban temporary foreign workers from from entering the province um uh i i don't think it's going to go that far um but the, you know in in theory the government could could try something like that where they 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 try to the alberta government uh, uh tries to prevent the or you know, maybe through cooperation with the federal government, um, uh, seeks to prevent people from qualifying for for work permits to work in the province of Alberta. Um, again, th that's pure speculation. I don't know if that's going to to happen, but based on Jason Kenney's uh, recent statements um, about prioritizing. Canadians and permanent residents, I, I think um, it, it wouldn't overly surprise me if there are some um, unfortunate consequences for, you know, people who are here temporarily in Canada or for people who want to come uh, to, to Alberta temporarily. Um, so... Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. I have uh, some clients who are chomping at the bit to submit AINP applications, and and uh, a few of these clients email me on a regular basis, and they ask me, you know, Ru Russ, is AINP still happening? Are they still processing applications? Are they still accepting applications? Uh, all I can tell them is, uh, for the time being, yes, but going forward who knows um so, so that's something to keep in mind that uh alberta immigrant nominee the alberta immigrant nominee program that that may possibly be halted uh in the not too distant future uh, so my recommendation would probably be if, if you're ready to go with an application, if you meet the requirements, uh, get it off as soon as you can. Um, is, is it possible the government may just stop processing applications that were already submitted and, and halt the program and re return applications where that haven't been processed to completion? That's entirely possible. Yes, it is. But... Um, uh, it's, it's also possible that the government might stop taking in new applications, but those already that have already been submitted will will be processed to completion. So, uh, I think if you meet the requirements under AINP, your best bet is to submit an application as soon as possible, um, and and keep your fingers crossed and hope for the best. So yeah, that, that would be my recommendation for AIMP. Uh, try to get your application submitted as quickly as possible, and but try to do a complete application. Um, I I haven't had this the sense at all that that AIMP is being lax or or easygoing about uh, you know their their expectations for applications. Um, it, if if you don't have a, a complete application uh, submitted to AINP, there there's a good chance uh, they just won't process your application at all. So uh, so I'd recommend uh, 
applying as soon as possible. But let's say, for example, you need 12 months of Canadian or Alberta work experience and you only have 10 months, don't submit your application now. If you only have 10 months of work experience, they're, they're, they're going to reject it for sure. Wait, wait until you meet the, the, the full requirement for, for the, the application and then submit the application, but, but do it as, as soon as possible. Um, wondering if there are any questions. Uh, does does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask at this point? No. Um, okay. Um, Maybe just give it a couple of more minutes. Um, I'm always curious where where people are from, so uh, and kind of what areas they're working in, that, that sort of thing, what their backgrounds are. So, um, yeah, maybe if, if you don't have an immigration question, want to tell me where you're from or what what your favorite food that you could. Uh, I, I like to interact with with people on the internet. I, I like to find out where where my viewers are from and uh, what interests them and and uh, what they're doing. Um, okay. Uh, Elia Lopez, she's from Mexico, living in Banff. Yeah, um, I've uh, met met a number of people over the years from Mexico and met a lot of uh, Mexicans working in Banff, actually, too. Um, when I was growing up, Banff seemed to uh, be really geared towards uh, Japanese tourists. When, back in the 90s, uh, the the late 80s, early 90s, if you'd go to Banff, you'd have, you know, all, all the, the shop stores in Japanese as well as in English and, and tons of Japanese tourists. And, and um, but now you go to Banff, there are still some Japanese tourists, but, uh, but I, I think those numbers have, have really gone down. And now uh, you have people from all over the world and people going to, to Banff and, and working on working holidays. And yeah, you have people from Latin America working there. You have people from Asia, you have people from Australia, from Europe, from yeah, all, all, all sorts of different places. Um, but uh, yeah, Banff is a, a beautiful place. I'm looking forward to, Going back there at some point once the the situation improves, I, I kind of I don't know if I'd even be allowed to go there right now. Uh, I heard that uh, Banff was discouraging uh, tourists, even tourists from Alberta, from from visiting there at, at the time being. Um, but I'm not sure if that's still still the case. Um, but once once Banff opens up again, I'm I'm looking forward to going back because uh, it's a, a beautiful place. It's always uh, quite uh, quite busy in Banff, and in, in some cases it, it seems uh, busier even than downtown Calgary, um, uh, especially on weekends and especially during the summer. Um, Oh, and Ellie is telling me she already has a PR application in progress, but she's lost her job. Um, yeah, hopefully there, there are a lot of people like that um, who uh, had everything going smoothly, but then the pandemic hit and, and now they've been laid off. Um, uh all I can say is, is I, I hope you'll be hired back, Elia. I hope uh, 
your your employer will uh, get back on their feet and be able to hire you back. And I hope that uh, that the loss of your job won't affect your PR application. Um, in some cases, uh, uh, people may have their Alberta Immigrant Nominee Program nomination affected by the loss of, of employment. I think AINP isn't going to revoke nominations as long as it's just a temporary loss of employment, but, um, but if people remain un, unemployed throughout the processing of their, their PR, their, the federal part of their provincial nominee application, I, I think um, there is the risk that, that people could actually uh, have their applications ultimately denied. Um, so, so I, I hope that's not the case in your, your situation, Elia. I hope you get your job back well, well before, uh, uh, IRCC is done processing your application and, and I hope you have smooth sailing and, you know, you, you get your PR without a hitch. Um, Elia mentioned she's working in hospitality, hospitality, provincial nominee, uh, if I find a new job, will that affect my PR application, new employer? Um, so not necessarily. Uh, if you, if you find a new job, it, it, it depends what, what the restrictions are on your nomination certificate. So, um, and it, it depends on what stream you applied under for, for permanent residence. So if you applied under the Alberta opportunity stream, for uh, under AIMP and then and then use that for for your nomination to apply uh, under the provincial nominee program federally. Um, so if if you're under the Alberta Opportunity Stream, you uh, you may not uh, have have to worry if you have a new employer um, because the Alberta Opportunity Stream no longer requires arranged employment with a particular employer, um, uh, but they do require a person to maintain valid lawful employment in the province of Alberta. Um, so a new job with a might, new employer might be okay. Double check, look, look at your certificate, see if it ha has any restrictions on employment. Um, but if a uh, certificate doesn't have restrictions on employment, then I, I think you're okay if, if you find a new employer. Um, uh, oh, and uh, Elia indicated she's on a post-grad work permit. Okay, good. Um, and, and it's possible that you might be able to qualify for, for a bridging uh, work permit as well if your post-grad work permit is within three months of expiring. Veronica indicated or she, she writes, hi, Russ, I have a quick question. Can I apply for a work permit while holding a study permit and studying? Uh, which one study permit work permit will be valid if uh, work permit approved? Good question, Veronica. So a person can in theory hold multiple permits. You can in theory hold a study permit and a work permit. Um, sometimes a person will have more than one work permit at the same time. They might have a closed work permit and an open work permit at the same time. And, and those, those permits all remain valid. Now that being said, um, I, I don't think it's likely that if you do have a study permit and you can be studying that you'll qualify for a, a work permit. Um, you now there are there are there are some situations. For example, under the the immigration and refugee protection regulations, there are provisions that allow for for students who are destitute to to apply for a work permit. So that means a student who isn't able to support themselves ordinarily, but but they can apply for a work permit. Mo most students don't need a work permit, though. Uh, in most cases. Uh, if you're currently studying, 
um, you're you're able to work uh, uh, up to 20 hours a week off campus, and you can actually work. There are no hourly limits to to work on campus. Um, so uh, so oftentimes international students will have on-campus jobs, they'll have security guard jobs on campus, or they'll be working in, you know, the food court to, at their university or something like that. Um, or they'll be working as a teaching assistant or something like that. Uh, so you can, in, in many cases, uh, and it depends on your study permit, some study par permits uh, allow people to work, other study permits don't. But um, but in most cases, you can work up to to uh, 20 hours a uh, a week off campus, and and you can also work on campus as well. Um, and then during semester breaks, you can work full time. And uh, and then after you're you're done your studies, when you graduate, you can apply for the postgraduate work permit. In many cases, um, so. Yeah, it's, it's theoretically possible you could apply for a work permit while you have a study permit. Um, but uh, A, you, you might not need that and lead to unintended problems down the road. So uh, if you apply for a work permit and, and you st start working but you stop studying, um, then uh, you might have a situation where uh, you get your study permit revoked even. Um, so um, if, if a person on a study permit isn't maintaining full-time studies, uh, what happens is the institution is actually required to report that to the government. And uh, so sometimes you have situations where people, they, they apply for a study permit, but what they really want to do is work in Canada. So they get the study permit, they, they maybe go to their first day of classes and then, and then they, they, they skip everything and they go and, and do a job. Um, when, when the institution later on reports that the person dropped out of all their classes or flunked out of all their classes or whatever, and, and, and now they're, they're not registered in any new classes in the, the second semester. Uh, th then the government, you know, they they might call you in for an interview and they'll say, well, you know, how, how come you're, you're here in Canada on a study permit, but, but you're not studying? What are, what are you doing? And um, if they find out that you're, you're really working and they determine that you didn't really have any intention to study, then uh, then they might uh, they might take steps to remove you from Canada. Um, so I, I've seen that with with some people in the past. Um, now sometimes there's a good reason for taking a break from studies. Maybe maybe the the institution where you're studying is no longer offering. Uh, a program of uh, like maybe maybe that program got canceled due to the pandemic maybe uh the institution just had to close its doors maybe you know there, there are all sorts of reasons maybe there, there are some personal circumstances that mean you have to take a break from your studies um so some sometimes people can justify uh you know taking a, a bit of a, a break or a hiatus from their studies and, and doing something else but um I, I don't usually recommend kind of jumping from studying to working to going to studying. Um, that's oftentimes difficult. And, and if you take a break from your studies and, and you get a work permit and then you want to apply for a study permit later on, uh, you may, may get, get some skepticism from the officer who's looking at the application. They they may wonder if, if your intention to study is in fact a, a a legitimate one. So, um, so back to your question, uh, Veronica. Uh, yes, in theory, you can have a work permit along with a study permit, but um, uh, I wouldn't necessarily recommend uh, going going that route. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Uh, 
Doesn't look like it. And I'm at the 11.21 mark. Uh, so uh, maybe I'll, I'll pack it in there for this week. Um, uh, I forgot to do this at the beginning of the webinar, but I'd really like to thank my, my student, Sunny Liu, uh, who's been helping me with this webinar series and who's been helping me at the office in general and allowing me to take some time to prepare for this series by uh, covering off um, most of my immigration files. Um, so if you're an existing immigration client of mine, chances are you've been working with Sunny and, and she's been doing the lion's share of the 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 uh, so much study um, yeah i look forward to sunny uh becoming called to the bar and becoming a full-fledged lawyer um uh in a not too distant future probably within you know six months or so um so thank you so much sunny Thank you to all of you who tuned in to watch this webinar. I, I hope it's helpful to you. Um, I plan on doing these webinars for the foreseeable future on Wednesday mornings at 10. So next week, if, if you aren't doing anything else, uh, feel free to, to, to join me at, at the same time in the same place. And if you have any questions, by all means, send them my way. You can send them to me dur during the chat. Uh, and you can, also, um, you can also email me, reach out to me in other ways. And if you have a, a burning question that, that you want to, to have discussed on the webinar, um, let me know and uh, I'll... Uh, be happy to to feature that information in the webinar, provided it deals with Canadian immigration law, and provided uh, it doesn't discuss personal uh, situations. It it only discusses kind of you know more more abstract type situations. Uh, be, because as I mentioned earlier, uh, this is public. This is the this is YouTube. Anyone can search this, so so I don't want to reveal very particular identifying details about you know viewers or or, or clients or, or people like that. But uh, by all means, send questions my way and uh, let me know if there's any information or content that you'd like me to present on uh, on my channel on on this webinar series and. Uh, I'd be happy to, to do that. Um, but uh, at any rate, I'll see you next week and thanks for watching. Bye for now.